And we move on to conversation number three here on the urban debate. To put the spotlight again on elections, this time on US elections. The first tweet by President Donald Trump you in US this morning reads in caps, in bold. It says, and I quote, stop the count. And a second tweet that came just minutes ago, that reads, once again, in all caps, the second tweet says, any vote that came in after election day will not be counted, end of quote. So where do things stand as far as the US presidential race is concerned? Well, most are projecting Joe Biden getting 253 electoral college votes and President Trump getting 213. But the counting is still on, even though at a very, very slow pace, Joe Biden seems to be inching closer to 270 electoral college votes, which is what either of them will need to win. But it is not yet over. Four crucial states. Arizona, Nevada, Georgia and Pennsylvania will effectively determine who gets to sit in Oval Office and becomes the 46th President of the United States of America. But, and there are many ifs and buts in this case, because Donald Trump has already decided to challenge the results in the court. Trump has gone to court in Pennsylvania. There is a lawsuit filed already to stop the counting of ballots. In Michigan, a lawsuit has been filed to stop the counting of ballots. In Georgia, a lawsuit has been filed. Why is Donald Trump calling this a fraud? Well, he claims that counting after voting day is illegal. Essentially, the mail-in votes that are being counted are illegal. He claims that secret pro-Biden votes are suddenly appearing from nowhere in places where Donald Trump was in the lead and was actually winning. These now votes in the name of Biden have appeared. And that's where the fraud is happening. He claims postal ballots received too late and that is part of a fraud. He claims bias, fraud, fraudulent counting is actually taking place for the postal ballots. Tonight, we continue with a special uh, focus on the US elections. Is it game over for Donald Trump? Or does he have a Trump card left? Where will the legal battle take them? And also, we'll analyze a little bit about the kind of response that the two got. Joe Biden seems to have gotten the highest number of votes ever. But President Trump and the kind of votes that he has got is also a significant improvement from the last time, especially uh, in very interesting places and very interesting vote banks. Let's analyze all of this and say good evening to us. Ashok Sajanhar, former diplomat, Mishi Chaudhary, lawyer and legal director at Software Freedom Law Center, joining us from New York. Seema Sirohi, columnist with the Economic Times, and Ms. Chidanan Rajghatta will also be with us shortly. He's the foreign editor for Times of India. Uh, let me just first get to the legalities. Uh, Mishi Chaudhary, thank you for staying with us. How do we... Uh, see and view what's happening. The lawsuits that are being filed to stop the counting um, or to question the mail-in ballots, the whole threat of going all the way to the Supreme Court. Are we not likely to find out who the next US president will be for months together? So um, the lawsuits which have been filed um, on Wednesday now, they have been filed in Pennsylvania, Michigan and Georgia. Now, they are laying the groundwork for contesting the battleground states because uh, obviously President Trump had said that he <clears> would be using the strategy if um, the voting doesn't happen in his favor or the results aren't. Um, the entire legal effort the Trump campaign is now mounting seems uh, to be trying to walk up and down the escalator because there are certain states where they would like to stop the count, as you were talking about the tweet now, uh, where they want to limit Mr. Biden's ability to build more comfortable margins. And even uh, as their team is starting to recount in others, where they want to cut in Mr. Biden's margins. So um, what happens even um, in like the Go Bore, uh, Bush versus Gore matter, which happened in 2000, the margins really matter here a lot. And considering that the margin numbers are now in thousands and not in hundreds as it used to be, so the legal battle is not going to result into something which is going to completely sway the election. That only happens when the numbers are really, really large. 
um, many of the electoral experts who have been actually uh, working on this for much longer than I have been watching it have said that recounts typically change tallies by only a few hundred votes here and there. And that's why the challenges seem to be more about uh, giving, playing from a defense and also giving more meet to what had already been claimed during the campaign rather than actually impacting the outcome of the elections. And the five battleground states so far have not really come out with the, the announcements and the counting is still going on. The only thing which perhaps is of a little interest is um, uh, whether the Supreme Court, which is the highest court, is going to intervene in any matter or not. But um, they've tried that, and that is uh, on Wednesday they had filed a motion for a case which was already for Pennsylvania, and it doesn't seem to be going place any place for now. Um, I think we will need to see a little bit more about the margins in the state of Nevada, where the margins are much lower, and a recount <coughs> can be requested by any losing candidate. That's an interesting state to look at. Michigan and Wisconsin, where, of course, um, the Trump campaign is asking for a recount. That's, again, an interesting thing. But um, uh, yes, it will last for a very long time. Um, that's why the Democratic campaign is now raising money for a legal strategy as well. And what they are saying is that they're going to protect the election. So it will last for some time. Um, December 14 is when um, the Electoral College meets. And then in January, first week is when Congress registers these votes before January 20th of uh, the swearing in. Mm -hmm. So we are watching for a legal battle. But again, I would say that the margin of votes is what matters here. If it's only a few hundreds, we might think about <coughs> lawsuits as a way to pr uh, protect something. But if not, if it's thousands, then uh, what is uh, the outcome will already be decided. And we are only spending time in various courts. Okay, that's interesting. Let me ask uh, Seema if she agrees, uh, um, uh, Seema Siroi, that um, these all seem to be tactics to buy more time uh, from the Republican side. At the end of the day, if anybody has to verify the ballots, they would show what the reality is. Right. And, you know, President Trump had prepared the ground for this uh, over the campaigning period that he would contest, he would allege things without much evidence. Uh, so that's what's playing out right now. Um, I mean, some of the lawsuits or some of the claims are kind of frivolous. Uh, like, for example, uh, in Georgia, they said that we don't have meaningful access, quote unquote, to the place where uh, votes are being counted, and we cannot observe all these people properly. Turns out the reporters who reported from that room said that you can see everything. So it's like a little bit frivolous. Uh, but in Nevada, I would agree with the previous panelists, it, uh, it, the margins are razor thin, razor thin. And the Trump campaign is saying that Mm. Thousands of people have voted uh, who don't live in uh, Nevada anymore. So there's some potential basis for questioning uh, the vote there. As far as Pennsylvania goes, I think the Supreme Court has left a little window open to reconsider the matter uh, because the votes that came in after November 3. Uh, are being kept separately by the authorities in Pennsylvania. Uh, they will rule on the matter, and that is the one potential place where the Trump campaign can mount something that uh, might end up mm -hmm. as, uh, as a challenge, as a real challenge. Because it is interesting, if you see Pennsylvania, um, uh, and there, uh, uh, as the voting has progressed over the last 24 hours especially, which has been largely the mail-in ballots that have been counted, and they've gone up from, you know, 76% uh, of the votes being counted to now about 91% of the votes have been counted. Trump's lead has uh, come down significantly, and that gap has narrowed down, and that's largely been why he's been talking more about Pennsylvania and, and, and calling it out. Uh, but Mr. Sajanar, good evening to you and always good to have you on the yeah, show. Um, how Thank does you. one view all of this, uh, you know, sitting here in India when the U.S. president says, I'm not going to leave office? 
Yeah, well, it doesn't speak uh, very well about the strength of the uh, democratic institution in uh, the United States. You know, as far as we are concerned in India, we are used to having all our problems, uh, you know, as far as voting is concerned, fraud is concerned, use of money power, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We are all used to going and knocking at the doors of the Electoral, uh, Election Commission of India. And then they will take care of it. They will have hearings. They will have video recordings and so on and so forth. And they'll make a pronouncement. And by and large, that pronouncement is what is accepted by everyone. And if someone really has a problem with that, then uh, they can go to the Supreme Court and uh, challenge that uh, decision. But unfortunately, what happens in the United States is that 50 states of the country have 50 laws, 50 rules, 50 regulations. For instance, you find that in uh, Pennsylvania, you cannot uh, start uh, opening and counting the mail-in ballots till the uh, in-person voting has been completed on the day of the uh, uh, election, that is on the 3rd of November in this case. Mm. Similarly is the case in Michigan. So, uh, you know, if Mr. Trump is saying that uh, you should stop counting after the uh, hours uh, when the voting has to be done, that is at 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock on the 3rd of uh, November, that means none of the mail-in uh, uh, ballots would be counted. So, uh, you know, of course, in the past, this has been happening that uh, if there are mail-in ballots, they would take a little more time. But in those cases, the mail-in ballots, the volume has not been as large as it has been in this case. Here, either early voting or the mail-in ballots have really uh, amounted to about 100 million. And if you look at it, the last time it was about 138 million who had voted this time, it's expected to be more than 160 million. So, you know, to deal with 100 million, of course, states like Florida and the others, they can start opening and they can start counting the mail-in ballots and the early voting before the election day. But there are some states, uh, and that is what, uh, you know, they got the decision on, the, uh, on last Sunday, that uh, they can, uh, if the, it is uh, the ballots, uh, if the envelopes are stamped uh, up to the 3rd of November, then they can be counted up to 6th of November, so it can be extended. But the last point I'd like to make here is that, uh, you know, what it appears, and I think many of the uh, news channels, as also the, uh, some of the agencies who are looking at it, they have given for Arizona for all practical purposes yeah. to Mr. Biden. So, you know, what you mentioned, 253, yeah. you add 11 to it, and that's 264. And so he just needs uh, Nevada. And as we've been talking, there is, uh, you know, razor edge, uh, razor thin uh, margins as far as Nevada is concerned. But uh, all the other four states that are still up in the air, you know, Pennsylvania, Georgia, North Carolina and Alaska, Correct. all of them have uh, Mr. Trump in the lead. So I think it is a, a, a battle that is really poised but with a heavy advantage to Mr. Biden as we look at and look at the situation from here at this juncture. Okay, Sorry. in fact, on that note, let's say good evening to Chidaran Rajgatta, for, foreign writer for Times of India. Mr. Rajgatta, would you agree that, I mean, the ba battle seems to be tilted in the favor of Joe Biden, basis what happens in Arizona and Nevada? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, uh, you know, the vote counts uh, suggest that uh, he's, uh, he has uh, an easier path to 270 and the White House. Uh, but I, I just want to, uh, you know, step back and, uh, you know, take a big picture. We, we can go into granular details about, you know, mail-in ballots, uh, pandemic, everything that has happened. But the single biggest reason for this whole, you know, fiasco, I mean, there's one reason, and that is Donald Trump, okay? It's, it's very clearly an individual thing. Uh, and to understand this, you have to go back. It's not like US elections have been perfect uh, before. And uh, everyone recalls you know, uh, the 2000 Bush versus score. It was very messy. It was very controversial. It was very narrow. You know, eventually, it was decided by something like, I think, 527 votes after you know, 9 million votes were uh, cast. But at the end of the process, even hard as it was, bitter as it was, Many Democrats felt very cheated uh, by the Supreme Court. What happened was Al Gore came out, accepted, and gave a very gracious uh, concession speech. Okay, 
Grace does not exist in the dictionary of Donald Trump. The word grace, mm -hmm, no. Okay, so no matter what happens, he had already indicated, I mean, not indicated, he had said it in plain words. The one thing you can credit Donald Trump is actually transparency. There was nothing secret about this. And if you go back, you know, weeks before the election, he had said that, you know, results have to be on election night. Okay, there's no law saying that. There's no constitutional requirement. Results are never on election night. You know, election night, what you hear on election night is media projections by Associated Press and ABC and the networks. So he had already laid out, you know, the groundwork, the, his playbook, uh, you know, that he was not going to accept the result. And he has said openly, transparently, I don't like losing. I'm not a, you know, I'm a bad loser. Uh, I win all the time. Uh, so this was happening in plain sight for weeks before the election. So I don't see why anyone should be surprised. I'll just end on one note that had it been any other Republican uh, candidate, anybody else, Mitch McConnell, you take whoever you want from the Republican side, and if he had run for president, sure enough, under the same circumstances, there would have been controversies, there would have been this thing, but nobody would have, you know, said stop the count or you know declare uh, ballots, uh, you know, after election day illegal, and you know, gone into such a <laughs> rage. So I mean, clearly, you know, it's a president of the United States who who uh, is want to, you know, uh, disenfranchise a large number of votes. And and look at the irony of it. Many of these votes, I mean, assuming the mail-in ballots which are being counted late might tilt towards, uh, you know, Biden. Mm. But many of them are also Trump voters. I see senior and elderly Trump voters who would have voted mail-in. <laughs> mail so this is, I mean, this is a fiasco which is entirely of Donald Trump's making. The election system is not perfect. It's a very, very messy system. I joked on another network that, you know, Rwanda and Burkina Faso can do this better. Right. Um, but, but this is, this is this, everything, this boils down to an individual. Uh, Donald Trump is the number one reason why this whole uh, process is... Uh, but I suspect uh, the mess is going to continue for, for, for a while. Um, you, and it doesn't look like uh, President Trump is going to back off anytime soon. But let me come to the second aspect. From what we've seen in terms of numbers and the voting patterns, um, it is being said uh, by many that he, the pollsters seem to have gotten it wrong again in many parts where they've underestimated Donald Trump's support or what he has done in the last, uh, you know, in this entire term and how he's gained. What is your view of that, Mr. Rajkata? Uh, is there uh, a sense that many still refuse to see that what Donald Trump does resonate with the Americans? First of all, let's step back. You know, the, the polls, polling, you know, uh, poll projections are not, you know, like uh, accurate forecast. I mean, they're, they're just an estimate. I don't think, you know, you can hold uh, this thing, uh, pollsters to uh, account. I mean, that said, yes, the, the, the one place where they seem to have gone terribly wrong is uh, underestimating the kind of uh, support and uh, Trump's, the expansion of the Trump base. I mean, that is truly staggering. Donald Trump, uh, you know, got 60 million votes uh, uh, in the last election. Uh, he's now nearing 68 million. I mean, that is a staggering rise. I mean, that tells you that this country is deeply divided. Uh, it, it, I mean, the fault lines were always there. We knew this, but the, the, it, it has sharpened so much. I mean, it's uh, urban versus rural. It's not just liberal, conservative, urban, rural, black, white. And if you really look at this whole election, it really boils down to, you know, the suppression of black votes, as far as I'm, I'm concerned. In every state where there's a dispute going on, right, in Michigan, in Pennsylvania, in North Carolina, in uh, Georgia, if you see the, the votes, the final votes that are coming in which, you know, Trump and his Republicans are trying to stop are actually, aside from mail-in ballots, are also from predominantly black dominated cities. I mean, um, uh, Detroit is 80% black. Uh, Philadelphia has a huge 50% black uh, majority. So does uh, so do the cities in uh, Georgia, um, you know, whether it's Atlanta or Augusta or Savannah, they're all 50% plus black. So th this, is, uh, th this is a long American tradition, which, you know, nobody talks about, you know, the suppression of uh, votes of black people. Mm. Um, so there, is, there are racial fault lines, there are urban rural fault lines. Uh, this is a very, very divided country right now. And, uh, you know, this election, uh, I don't know when, uh, you know, they will be able to resolve it, but uh, healing is going to take a long time, if ever. Uh, I mean, Biden made a very gracious speech. Uh, 
And if if he wins, uh, you know, don't expect uh, Donald Trump to make a gracious concession speech. Concession speech is a very, uh, you know, uh, honored American legacy for 120 years. Every president, uh, presidential candidate who has lost has always come out and made a concession speech, like I said, including Al Gore. Don't expect that from uh, Donald Trump. And not just that, I, I also have to say now they're all, assuming uh, Biden wins, People are also already talking about, uh, you know, what happens to Donald Trump. He's not going to go away. Uh, Donald Trump, uh, you know, out of office will be even more unhinged. So you can expect, uh, you know, a terrible four years uh, ahead, uh, no matter who wins, actually. We'll take that point forward and, you know, um, ask Seema uh, this question. Seema, because I am reading, uh, uh, you know, some of the analysis that has been done where even in, in some of the swing states, uh, uh, Seema Siroi, the Latinos have ended up voting for Donald Trump now. How do you explain um, the uh, non-white growing support base for Donald Trump? See, he shaved off a good chunk of black men and Latino men and women, may I add, because I think what the liberal bubble in Washington and New York fails to understand that there is this other half that is very Christian, uh, believes in certain values to which the Trump campaign and Trump himself has made big appeals. Um, and uh, Latinos are very, very uh, big Christian voting bloc. So he managed to shave off some of those people to his side. The black men primarily because uh, he offered certain incentives. He's got, he's given a lot of money to the historic black colleges, something that you won't read in the mainstream press. Uh, it just doesn't get acknowledged. He has done things. So people who have, uh, you know, who don't have a bias with one side or another uh, will see all this. And uh, that's why half the country pretty much uh, voted for him. If you listen to the pollsters, uh, you would have thought a blue wave was coming and we are all going to drown uh, in democracy, yeah. but uh, it didn't come. Why? Because the polls also uh, are very questionable sometimes, the samples they use, the way they choose the samples. So, I mean, the more I read about how polling is done, uh, the less enamored I am. Uh, with the, with what the polls just find, you're absolutely right because they were giving close to 300, and look where it stands right now. Uh, we are still waiting uh, for for clarity in several states, and it's literally gone down to the wire. So I I, I get the point that you're making. Is that a, uh, is that not just a problem limited to United States, Mr. Ashok Sajinhar? That you know the the two sides have become so polarized and so closed uh, to the existence and the rationales of the other side. We just don't want to hear what the other side has to say, and which is why in many cases, at least the left liberals get very surprised when, uh, when the right wingers win. Yeah, you are absolutely right, I think, there. And, uh, you know, I agree with uh, Seema when she says that, uh, you know, the pollsters and also the media, the uh, liberal media, that seems to be living in some sort of an echo chamber. And, uh, you know, they got it uh, horribly wrong in 2016. And one would have hoped and expected that they had learned their lessons. And what I was able to read and hear is uh, what they said at, in 2016, what they were taken by surprise is that the young white voters without college degrees, so not very educated, so they were so very strongly in favor of Mr. Trump. And you know what he had to offer that uh, he was out of the Beltway. He didn't uh, really come from the traditional politics. He was a businessman. He had done well in business. Of course, uh, I think that's uh, still a moot point as to how successful a businessman he is or was. But at least, you know, this is what uh, the carrot that he dangled in front of them and that he'll be able to make their lives uh, better. So this is what they got in for, basically for economics. And I think in the present case also, you know, what Seema has mentioned about you know, some of the blacks and uh, Hispanics and so on and so forth. Maybe they've also benefited from uh, the, the betterment of the economy because that is 
you know, sitting so far away. That is what we hear, at least uh, before the pandemic struck, the economy was doing uh, fairly well, in, both in terms of, uh, you know, the un unemployment numbers, jobless numbers having come down, GDP having gone up, tax uh, <clears throat> uh, cuts having sort of, you know, benefited a uh, lot of people. So I think all these aspects uh, possibly uh, had helped uh, these people. But uh, what the what the pollster said this time is that we have taken on board, we have learned from our mistakes of 2016, and we have sort of, you know, taken on board these uh, 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 non-college degree holders, white people, and particularly in rural and suburban areas. But that doesn't seem to have really helped this at all. But, uh, you know, what I want to say here is it is a deeply divided society, of course, ideological differences between uh, Democrats and Republicans have always been there in terms of the policies. But I think it is also the presence of an individual like Mr. Trump, which has really divided the society in this way. And going forward, I think whoever is the president is going to be extremely difficult to govern this country. Mm. Because, uh, <clears throat> you know, if you have, let us say, about 75 or 80 million people who have voted for Mr. Biden. There are 70 to 75 million people who have voted for Trump. So I think, and their uh, stance are absolutely different. And Mr. Biden, if he comes just with 270 in the electoral college, then he's not even going to have a good control over his own party. So he's going to be dictated in terms of policies maybe by the uh, extreme left or, uh, you know, what have been the charges, you know, the Bernie Sanders group, and, uh, and that is going to create even greater problems. Now, the last question that you asked whether this is not a phenomenon in other countries. Yes, it is a phenomenon in other countries, but I think in other countries, meaning if you look at India, meaning India is not the subject of discussion today, but uh, I think whatever is done, even as far as, let's say, dealing with the pandemic is concerned, notwithstanding the fact that, you know, what we have had in terms of number of cases, right. but in terms of number of recoveries, in terms of number of deaths, and the manner in which it has been handled by the leadership with hands-on on a scientific approach. And you see that uh, Mr. Modi, whatever uh, his critics might say, right. his personal popularity with the people has continued to uh, remain the same or grow. So I think in that sense, he's had a finger on the pulse of the people and he's been able to motivate them to do in terms of wearing masks, in terms of keeping distance, etc. So I think uh, that problem, that challenge is there, yes, but uh, different countries are handling it in, you know, much more uh, sophisticated and better ways. But you, one and very we... interesting thing that you said is uh, to have the, you know, the finger on the pulse of the people. And um, Mishi Chaudhary, do you, do you believe that that's what Donald Trump also managed? And at the end of the day, for many, it's still about their daily livelihood, their business, um, the economy uh, and their life, rather than, you know, be just basing their vote on racism. Um, so uh, I think there are three different strains about the discussion you're having. One is an actual um, structural problem with the U.S. electoral system. Um, electoral college itself does have a basis in <clears throat> racism. There was a time when it was actually instituted when um, the African-American population, the slave population, was not even counted as a good person. And this was supposed to give advantage. Thereafter come gerrymandering, which are mostly political and partisan based. Um, and um, uh, as uh, the earlier panelists have pointed out, the variety of laws based in different states also contribute to a problem which is structural. And then a lot of norms and other things which were expected in the American tradition, they did not ever expect that a wrecking ball like the current president would come and would take everything for a toss. And that's, of course, the test of how far one can go about uh, uh, how laws or norms, et cetera, are uh, established. With Donald Trump, one of the problems about the Democrats is that a decade ago, the Democrats believed that the demographic, demographic change, this shift from majority white country to a majority uh, minority one, would give them almost an unbreakable lock on their national politics. Um, something which is to be said, okay, the growing population of Asian and Hispanic Americans would inevitably 
re- would lean towards the lib- and g- give liberals and uh, the Democrats the benefit, which is a wrong assessment in a way that um, it's a seductive theory. It's great uh, in terms of if you want to look at it from that point of view, but there's not really much evidence that we have seen to support a vision that this is where everybody would lean. Mm. The racial and ethnic identity is very fluid. There is no guarantee that a future member of that group will think of themselves as minorities. There is also, um, that is what we see in the Miami-Dade area and the county. The idea of understanding that the Cuban Americans are going to vote exactly like every other group of Hispanics is also misplaced. Now, coming to Mr. Trump, um, uh, there is, of course, the liberal hope for the 2020 election that it's going to be some repudiation of Donald Trump completely, of course, was misplaced as we are already watching. It is going to be a very thin margin, even if um, Mr. Biden wins. And um, uh, popular vote, which is important for legitimacy, also, although not popular for electoral college, that's why Hillary Clinton had 3 million popular votes more than Donald Trump, but he still won in 2016. That really matters. And what one must note is that Trump outperformed his job approval. He's now, um, uh, as earlier was pointed out, winning more votes. But what is going to be left behind is Trumpism, which Mm. is what we are watching everywhere else in the world. It's, It's like a series of performance for nationalism it triangulates there's open chauvinism about it there is also this dominant ethnic group which says uh, that um, uh, which narrows the appeal for inclusion of minorities about and which says there's going to be material gain if you put us in power it's like watching his um, reality tv show play out in politics also yeah. So you're competitors, you're aggressive, you are you have this aggrieved masculinity also, which is centered. And then you see that uh, those people win. That's why if um, the analysis of those who have voted and the inroads Mr. Trump has right now made mm. are about more black men and Hispanic men. And there is deviation from the uh, white suburban women. And uh, of course, the um, uh, people of color were already... Uh, leaning in a different direction. So I think um, that why Mr. Trump made a lot of gains, etc., is something which people will analyze. Mm. Uh, in uh, in Florida, for example, <clears throat> he has been, and in the Republican Party, they've been very consistent on their message, uh, which is to say to the Cuban Americans, to the Venezuelan Americans, to say something which is not even true, but to say that, oh, if, if Biden comes into power, He's bringing socialism, that socialism which you fled from your own countries. And of course, the way communist countries like Venezuela or um, uh, Cuba, the specter of that socialism did play a big role in making those voters lean towards Mr. Trump. Correct. And the Democrats have not done much there. I, in Georgia, I, we have seen now whether Stacey Abrams um, Georgia is the future or we were just expecting things which were out in the news and the liberals love to look at. Right. Uh, I would that uh, the, uh, the echo chamber has only had a little bit of more trips to the Midwest and an assumption that, OK, we made five more trips than we made in 2016 election. So we are doing a little better. Mm. Uh, we, we know that media companies have done a better job in tackling misinformation. We do know that um, uh, media is doing a little better. Than well, Mushi, that doesn't. Mean that well, I, I can say one thing um, that's common between the two countries, and I'm sure all of our panelists are well aware of it, is the menace of misinformation uh, and the role that media should play, and the, to the extent that we are able to play or not uh, in fighting that misinformation. And that, that I think, is a continuous battle uh, and the biggest challenge for us in the coming days. So much more to discuss, but I have a feeling we're all going to be back in the coming days since this uh, this issue is not going to get resolved and we may not have an answer anytime soon, maybe. Or there could be more controversy, especially with Donald Trump in the fray. So a big thank you to all the panelists for joining us right now uh, on this conversation. Completely out of time, viewers. We're still awaiting. It does look like Joe Biden uh, is inching closer to a definitive victory, but... 
we can't say until each single one of those votes are count. And then, if there are legal battles involved and derails the whole process, we'll wait and watch how it really goes. United States of America still doesn't know who its next president is going to be. Thank you so much for joining us on this conversation.